Welcome to this presentation on the minimum total potential energy formulation. Uh, if you haven't already, make sure you download the notes for this. There'll be the link is in the description. Also, if you haven't seen the direct formulation presentation already, maybe go back and watch that because there's some stuff there that kind of helps inform what's happening here, but they're relatively independent uh, presentations. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to work through these steps. Again, the basic steps for the uh, finite element method. And we'll see how these work with the uh, minimum total potential energy formulation. Now, again, there's three different uh, problems. We've already done the direct formulation. Uh, in this presentation, we're doing the minimum total potential energy. And then uh, next time, we'll do the weighted residual formulation. All right. Again, which to use, check out the handout. It says uh, there under which circumstances. Again, it's more of an advanced uh, concept to determine which one of those we want to, uh, to deal with. All right, so some of the background here. Potential energy is the difference between the total strain energy and the work done by the external forces. All right, so it'll make a little bit more sense as we move into what that means. But the potential energy is the difference between the total strain energy, how much we've strained our material. Think about that tapered rod example from the, the direct formulation. If we stretch that thing versus the work done in the process of stretching it. All right. So here's the uh, potential energy is our capital pi term. This is right here. So that's the potential energy. And then the, it's the sum of all the strain energy for each element. So we've got to sum it up for each, the strain energy we get from each element. And then we subtract off of it the amount of work done, total work done for the item we're looking at for all the elements that are involved there. All right, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to develop, determine the strain energy piece and look at how we can determine uh, this value as well, which is a little bit more straightforward. All right, so let's get into that. So strain energy, uh, at least for a material uh, products that we're going to be looking at, it's one half the stress multiplied by the strain over the entire volume. We're going to integrate that over the entire volume. All right, so what we can do is with Hooke's law, we can substitute in for the, the stress here, modulus times the strain, so now we get the modulus times the strain squared for our strain energy. So what happens is the strain energy is the area under the stress strain curve multiplied by the material volume. That's where that total strain energy comes. So the, the area under the stress strain curve multiplied over the material by the material volume. That's effectively where you're strain energy from. All right, so the minimum total potential energy is it looks to minimize right, by using the differentiation. We're going to differentiate the potential energy by the displacement to determine what the minimum value is. All right, so then we differentiate our strain energy, and we're also going to differentiate with respect to the position R, the work done. All right, so this is valid for stable systems, and we ultimately be able to find the displacement when the potential energy is at a minimum, hence the name minimum total potential energy formulation. So stable systems, and when the potential energy is at a minimum. All right, so let's get into that. Uh, here's an example with a bar. And we got six inches over until we have some force being applied, 35 pounds. We have a six pound force. That's not clear here, but it's two inches in here, which I'll have in the next diagram. Um, we have this one at the end of our rod um, where the K constant of the spring is 60 pounds per inch. So we want to figure out how far this spring is deflected. Right, how far is this? Spring deflect basically how it's going to be compressed there, so by how much. Uh, we're going to do that via uh, FBD and static, so a relatively simple analysis there. Again, we can do that here because of the, the simple structure we're looking at. And then we've applied the minimum total potential energy formulation to it to see how it compares and how we handle that. All right, so let's break this down. We've got our FBD here, so we're going to have our pivot point over here is A. We've got five inches. Oh, that was only one inch, so I'm sorry. Uh, five inches over gives us our six pound force. We got our six uh, inches over to our 35 pound force and two inches then to wherever that force of the spring is acting in the um, upward direction there. So if we do the sum of the moments about A and we'll do, we'll uh, use our right hand rule. So positive values uh, working in the counterclockwise direction. We get uh, minus six pounds or the, the six pounds is being applied, multiplied by five inches being applied in the negative direction. So being applied this way, all right, at point A. And then 35 pounds is being applied in the same direction 
but the spring force being applied in the other direction, so it's positive. Okay. Solve for the force, and we get 30 pounds. Right. And we can use our uh, force times our spring constant times the displacement. And knowing that from the previous picture, it showed that the spring constants are 60 pounds per inch. Uh, force that we just calculated is 30 pounds. So we come up with the displacement is going to be a half an inch uh, for that spring, uh, how much it's compressed. All right, so that's our FBD and statics approach. Now let's look at the minimum total potential energy approach. Right, so we have the same setup with distances and whatnot. But uh, what we're looking at here is the elastic energy for the spring. Right? So the elastic energy, the strain energy, is going to be one half kx squared. All right? So k we know is 60 pounds, pound inch, pounds per inch. And x squared is what we're going to be solving for. Right? So we ultimately come up with this value here. Now, the trick is how are we going to get this x value here? Um, especially when we have these guys here. We got xg and we got x. XB, and we don't know how far those are going to deflect, but we do, or what we're going to solve for is this X value. So what we want to do is get the amount of deflection at, for point G and the amount of deflection for point B. And then and we want to relate that to our X value uh, that we're going to be solving for. And the way we can do that is if we can look here at our, something that looks very similar here, that distance versus this distance, or this distance versus this distance, or this distance versus this distance, or actually the shapes they all make. So one, two, and three, we got our similar triangles for all three of those shapes there. And so that's what we're gonna use. So we got XG with five inches, XB with six inches, and X with eight inches. So if we relate those as being similar triangles, we'll have the uh, one we were solving for out where the spring's at is at eight inches. Point G was at five inches. And again, similar triangles, so out to where we're solving for the X versus XB at six inches. All right, so solving both those equations for XG and XB, and then we're gonna substitute those in to our work for the external forces. So the force we know is uh, six pounds and 35 pounds. And then the displacement at those positions is gonna be XG and XB. All right, so we're gonna substitute for XG our five eighths, and that's gonna get substituted in there. And then our three quarters substituting for XB right there. All right, and so now we're just solving, uh, carrying out the, um, the math here. So 15 pounds over four, or five over four. Right. And ultimately, we solve 30 pounds times x is the amount of external work that's applied there on our piece. All right, so we're going to substitute all, bring those all back into the total potential energy formulation for the system. So substituting for the strain energy, we get our 30 pounds x squared, and we got our 30 times x for our work. Now we want to minimize, because it's the minimum total potential energy. So we're going to differentiate with respect to x, with respect to our displacement. Right, so we got our differentiation with respect to x. So we got uh, 30x squared minus 30x equals zero. All right, so we take the differentiate this with respect to x. Uh, x multiply times 30, so we get our 60. And 30, the x just goes away, so we get the 30 comes down here. Solving for x, and we get x is equal to a half inch, which is what we have for the FB and statics approach. All right, so hopefully that uh, gives you a good context of how we can apply this. So we're not going to do it. Uh, apply this to our tapered bar example that we had from the direct formulation. So again, go back to the direct formulation if you want to see some of the details um, of basically sizing and spring constant and whatnot. But we're going to discretize it as before. All right, so we got five nodes, four elements. And we want to find the displacement using the minimum total potential energy formulation. All right, so let's get into that. Here we go. All right, so we already have it discretized, so we skipped step one. Step two now, we're doing the shape function um, using, determining the shape function based on the minimum total potential energy formulation. So we need to come up with strain energy as well as the uh, work. So strain energy, again, same as the previous example we did here, was one half times the modus times strain squared. And because we're integrating with respect to the volume, we can bring these terms out because they're constant. All right, and then if we just integrate what's left here, it just becomes the volume. So that's pretty simple integration there. 
Uh, substituting for the strain, though, we're going to use this from before, from the direct formulation presentation. We have the change in displacement of the nodes on either end of the element divided by the initial length. And uh, for the volume, we're going to substitute the average area times the uh, length, the average cross section area times the uh, length of that element. So making those substitutions, we have for the volume there, and we have our strain is our change of displacements over the original length. And carrying out the squared function here, we come up with the values there in the parentheses. All right, so that is our strain energy for an element. So the, the E here in the numerator is represents for the element. All right, so we're going to minimize that now. So we're going to differentiate with respect to the displacement. Right, and this is going to be specifically at node i. We're going to do it with respect to displacement node i. So we have the partial with respect to the uh, displacement node i. So here's our function from the previous slide. And if we differentiate with respect to just at node i, this term is going to go away. Right? That term goes to zero. This term is going to go to two ui, which is right here. And this term we're going to lose our um, ui sub u sub i plus one, or sorry, u sub i, because we're differentiating with respect to u sub i, so that one's, let me ooh, fix that here. That one is, erase it, there we go. This one's gone, and we keep these two. All right, so that is for um, minimizing with respect to node i. Now we need to do the same thing. Oops, sorry, finishing out here. All right, bring the two over to the left-hand side here, and then we get our, um, u minus u, uh, u i plus 1. And notice here that we're collecting our area times the modulus over the length into our um, a k constant for the spring or the stiffness of the material. Now again, that was all for node i. We're going to do the same thing for uh, node i plus 1. And we come up with a very similar formulation for our minimum strain energy. And hopefully this looks familiar as we think about what we did in the direct formulation. All right, so now we're going to do our element equations. We're going to combine what we had for the different uh, shapes of the different nodes into our element equations. And if we do that, we have the minimum total potential energy at node i and at node i plus 1. And we can see we have the uh, stiffness matrix here for our element um, multiplied by our displacement matrix for our element and where our k value is a e over l. Uh, for the work of the external forces, we're going to have just the force times the displacement at node i plus the force at i plus 1 times the displacement at that node. And we need to minimize that, so differentiate that with respect to node i, displacement at node i, and differentiate with respect to the displacement at node i plus 1. And doing that, we just end up with the force at node i and the force at i plus 1. All right, so we're bringing that all back together. And assemble that into our global matrix. So we bring together the whole total potential, total minimum total potential energy formulation. And here we go, I for each one of our elements. Right, we're going to put into our form of our stiffness times our displacement minus our forcing matrix. So there's our global stiffness matrix as we put it together for each element, just the same way as we did in the direct formulation. All right, and now we just solve for our primary unknowns. All right, so here's our displacement matrix, and we have our forcing matrix. We're going to change that first row by the boundary condition. All right, we're going to apply the boundary condition because we know that at node 1, the displacement is 0, so we need to do that uh, application as well. And then we already have the, um, the load being applied at node 5, uh, 1,000 pounds. And that's, again, that's because of the uh, displacement at node 1 is equal to 0. That's why we do that, this uh, changing that row. All right, and there's what our global stiffness matrix looks like when we plug in the actual values, All right? And we got the final matrix equation, our global stiffness matrix from up here. Let me write down here. Um, our displacement matrix and our load matrix. And solving for that, we get these displacements. Wow, I just kind of sped through all that. But the reason why is this. This is the same solution as the direct formulation. Now, hopefully a couple slides back, you noticed that Wow, this, uh, as we combine the forcing equations, the minimum total energy equation 
uh, analysis we did each node and we combine it into the elemental equation, that was pretty much the same thing as the direct formulation. Now, will it always be that way? No, it won't. It's, again, it's a very simple example, and that's why it shows up uh, coming out to be the same exact answers. All right, so hopefully that gave you a good perspective on how we do the finite element method steps, steps using the minimum total potential energy formulation. And uh, let me know if you have any questions below, and I hope to see you for the next video.